on a calm winter day in Hudson, Wisconsin, February 5th, 2002, the air was crisp and the town was immersed in its usual tranquil pace. St. Croix County Medical Examiner Marty Shanklin was embarking on his post-lunch routine, a task that brought him to the O'Connell Funeral Home at approximately 1.40 p.m. His purpose was simple, to obtain signatures on a death certificate. This day, however, was far from ordinary. The funeral home, usually a place of somber tranquility, was eerily quiet as Shanklin entered. Expecting a routine visit, he proceeded to Dan O'Connell's office, only to be confronted with a harrowing and unimaginable scene. There, he discovered the lifeless bodies of Dan O'Connell, the respected funeral director, and his young assistant, 22-year-old James Ellison. The scene was one of horror and chaos. Dan was slumped lifelessly over his desk, while James lay fallen backward in a chair, the room marked by the violence of their untimely deaths. Overwhelmed by shock and fear, fearing the perpetrator might still be lurking within, Shanklin hastily exited the building, rushing to alert law enforcement. The discovery sent ripples of horror through the small, close-knit community. In a town like Hudson, word of such a tragedy spread rapidly. As the police cordoned off the scene, a sense of disbelief and grief enveloped the town. Hudson was a place where such brutal acts were unfathomable, particularly against two highly regarded and integral members of the community like Dan and James. The investigation that followed was extensive, involving over 2,000 interviews, yet it hit a dead end. The mystery of who was responsible for this heinous crime loomed over Hudson, casting a shadow of unsolved sorrow. The case grew cold, and it seemed as though justice might elude Dan and James. However, when detectives Jeff Knopps and Sean Petty took over the case, they approached it with renewed vigor and a fresh perspective. Their investigation led them to scrutinize the actions and statements of a figure beyond typical suspicion, a respected member of the community, a priest. This new angle in the investigation hinted at unraveling the dark mystery that had haunted Hudson for too long. Ryan Erickson's journey began amidst the quiet serenity of Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, where he was born into the heartwarming embrace of Dennis and Mary Erickson on a brisk winter's day, January 17, 1973. As the middle child in a devout Catholic family, with his sister Sonia and brother Travis by his side, Ryan's childhood was imbued with a deep sense of faith and strong family values, characteristic of the Erickson household. Growing up in Campbellsport, Ryan's early life was painted with the vibrant colors of small-town America, a mosaic of school plays, Sunday church services, and close-knit family gatherings. This idyllic simplicity, however, took a turn when adolescence ushered in a major shift in his life. Ryan's parents moved away, entrusting him to the care of a local priest. This unique upbringing under the guidance of a religious figure profoundly influenced Ryan, embedding a sense of spiritual calling within him. The summers at a family campground in Eagle River became a sanctuary for Ryan, a precious time to reconnect and fortify the family bonds that he deeply cherished. 
These reunions were a tapestry of laughter, shared stories, and the rekindling of familial love. Ryan's journey towards priesthood was not just a choice, but a calling he felt in his very core. Immersed in the teachings and rituals of the church, he pursued his religious studies with fervor at a seminary in Winona. His commitment culminated in his ordination in 2000, marking the beginning of a new chapter as a pastor at St. Patrick's in Hudson. In Hudson, a picturesque town cradled by the St. Croix River and only a stone's throw from the Twin Cities, the sense of community was palpable. It was a place where life's tapestry was woven through shared experiences, mutual support, and a common faith that bound its 12,000 residents together. Father Ryan Erickson's arrival in Hudson was met with a warm embrace. His youthful vibrance and charismatic aura quickly endeared him to the congregation, particularly the younger members. Yet, beneath his youthful exterior was a soul resonant with age-old traditions. His sermons, brimming with fervor about salvation and repentance, would often stir the souls of his listeners leaving both him and the congregation profoundly moved. As a youth pastor, Father Ryan's duties extended well beyond the pulpit. He was a guiding light for the young minds at St. Patrick's School, though his adherence to traditionalist views sometimes jarred with contemporary educational approaches. His insistence on teenagers confiding their deepest thoughts to him while rooted in a desire to guide them spiritually often received mixed reactions. Father Ryan's unique blend of unwavering traditionalism and modern-day communication was noteworthy. Through his daily emails titled Thought of the Day, he offered spiritual counsel, unafraid to tackle contentious issues like the liberal dress codes of young female parishioners. His candidness on such sensitive topics elicited a spectrum of responses. While some parishioners found his views unsettling, many others revered him as a moral beacon. Valuing his commitment to his pastoral duties and his active participation in community life. Far more than just a clergyman, Father Ryan was a vital thread in the fabric of Hudson's community life. Engaging in sports with the local youth and sharing casual moments with their families. However, beneath this facade of community involvement and spiritual guidance, there lay hidden complexities within Father Ryan Erickson. When a tragic incident shook the town, revealing the untimely deaths of two innocent men, the police found themselves grappling with a baffling mystery. Despite thorough investigations, they could not unearth any link between the priest and this heinous crime, leaving an unsettling question mark over the circumstances that unfolded that fateful day. Dan O'Connell, born on February 23, 1962, had a life steeped in community and care. Raised in the nurturing halls of St. Patrick's Elementary School and Hudson High, from where he graduated in 1981, Dan's journey was marked by an early passion for helping others. This drive led him to become an EMT in his senior year, and later to the University of Minnesota, where he pursued mortuary science, graduating with honors. His career path took a heartfelt turn when he worked as a paramedic from 1984 to 1988. 
Eventually, love and family beckoned, and Dan married Jenny McKnight, joining the family business, O'Connell's Funeral Home in Hudson. Together with Jenny, he raised two children, Kyle and Caitlin, in a home brimming with love and community spirit. Dan's role in the family business, alongside his father, Thomas, and brother, Mike, was more than a job. It was a calling. His innate compassion made him an exceptional funeral director. Beyond his professional life, Dan was a pillar of the Hudson community, dedicating his time to the Rotary Club, YMCA, Boy Scouts, and Knights of Columbus. His commitment shone brightest when following the 9-11 attacks, Dan and Mike hosted a spaghetti dinner, raising $25,000 for New York's emergency services, feeding over 2,000 people. Family was Dan's cornerstone, never missing a recital or game, and Sundays were a time for church and fellowship with friends, many of whom were longtime acquaintances from his and Jenny's childhood. In 2001, Dan mentored James Ellison, a 22-year-old intern and mortuary science student from the University of Wisconsin River Falls. James, coming from a Lutheran family, brought a new perspective to the funeral home, especially handling non-Catholic burials. His kindness and humor made him a beloved figure, both at work and with friends. However, tragedy struck on February 6, 2002. In a shocking daylight incident, Dan and James were found fatally shot at O'Connell's funeral home. The community was stunned. Initial police investigations revealed little, but the impact was profound. Dan's brother Mike and father James DeBruzzi were among the first to arrive at the devastating scene. The community grieved deeply. Dan's funeral, held at St. Patrick's Church on February 9th, was a testament to his impact, drawing 1,300 attendees in what is remembered as Hudson's largest funeral. As the town mourned, questions lingered. The investigation, despite extensive interviews and theories, struggled to find answers. The nature of the killings, executed with a 9 mm handgun at close range, suggested a deliberate act by a skilled individual. As the town grappled with this loss, the mystery of Dan and James's untimely deaths remained, leaving a lingering shadow over their profound contributions to Hudson and its people. For two long years, the murder case of Dan O'Connell and James Ellison lay dormant, a painful, unresolved chapter in the lives of their families. But in April 2004, Detectives Jeff Knopps and Sean Petty breathed new life into the investigation. Their renewed efforts brought two individuals into focus, a sharpshooting policeman and father Ryan Erickson. During this time, a 20-year-old man stepped forward with disturbing allegations against Father Erickson, recounting time spent at St. Patrick's Rectory. He claimed Erickson provided alcohol to him and his friends and, more alarmingly, subjected him to sexual abuse. Father Erickson had since been transferred first to a parish in Ladysmith in 2003 and then to the Church of St. Mary of the Seven Dolors in Hurley. However, Erickson's past was shadowed by allegations of sexual misconduct dating back to his seminary days in Winona in 1994, including a complaint of waking up to find Erickson in his bed. Despite these allegations, a psychological evaluation cleared Erickson, and he was ordained and assigned to St. Patrick's S.
In Hurley, investigators found Ericsson to be a respected spiritual leader. During their interview in December 2004, Ericsson admitted to serving alcohol to minors, but defended his actions. However, when questioned about the funeral home murders, Ericsson's knowledge of undisclosed details, the position and wounds of the bodies, raised suspicion. He claimed to have heard it through local gossip, but his alibi for the day of the murders was unclear. Further inquiries revealed that Ericsson had never mentioned an alibi of taking a nap at a parishioner's home on the day of the murders. His close friend, Deacon Russell Lundgren, shockingly relayed that Ericsson had confessed to the crime. As the investigation deepened, another young man corroborated the allegations of underage alcohol consumption and added a chilling detail of Ericsson miming shooting church members he disliked. Plans for a polygraph test were halted when Ericsson, under increasing scrutiny, took his own life in December 2004. Ericsson's suicide was seen by investigators as an implicit admission of guilt. Subpoenaed documents from the diocese revealed Ericsson's troubled past, including concerns about alcohol abuse, behavioural issues, and allegations of sexual misconduct. His computer contained teenage pornography, contradicting his pious image. Despite this mounting evidence of Ericsson's troubled character, investigators still lacked a clear motive linking him to the murders of O'Connell and Ellison. The pursuit of justice continued with the hope of bringing closure to this tragic and complex case. In 2005, a pivotal revelation emerged from Mary Pagel, a bus driver whose insights would crack open the O'Connell and Ellison case. Mary, a fellow churchgoer, recalled a significant conversation with Dan O'Connell just before his tragic demise. On February 5th, Mary encountered Dan at a local Walmart. Over coffee, Dan expressed concerns about Father Ryan Erickson's behaviour towards children, particularly noting Erickson's apparent favouritism towards boys. Dan, determined to address these suspicions, confided in Mary his plan to confront Father Erickson that very day. Mary witnessed Erickson, unusually dressed in casual attire, leaving the rectory and driving away in his silver Buick Regal. Her testimony, validated by a past polygraph test, indicated Ericsson's motive, silencing Dan to conceal his misdeeds, with James tragically becoming an unintended victim. Investigators pieced together the fateful events. Dan had called Father Ericsson for a meeting, unaware of Ericsson's deep-seated secrets. On February 5th, Ericsson confronted Dan at his office and, in a chilling act, shot him at point-blank range. James, arriving at the scene, was also fatally shot by Ericsson in a bid to eliminate any witnesses. Further evidence surfaced, including an eyewitness account of a man resembling Ericsson leaving the funeral home and Ericsson's own mention of a terrible tragedy at the funeral home before it was publicly known. He even confessed to a parishioner about an argument with Dan, corroborated by polygraphed testimony. In a haunting twist, Ericsson, wearing his priestly robes, consoled the grieving O'Connell family, hiding his guilt behind a facade of spiritual guidance. The case culminated in a John Doe hearing in October 2005, 
where Ericsson posthumously was identified as the perpetrator. In response to this tragedy, the O'Connell and Ellison families channeled their grief into advocacy, seeking reforms in the Catholic Church's handling of clergy misconduct and establishing foundations dedicated to protecting children and supporting abuse survivors. The case painted a stark contrast between Ericsson's public persona and his concealed, darker nature. His final words to investigators, a claim that he would confess to a heinous crime, echoed ironically against his ultimate inability to live with his guilt, leading to his suicide. Ericsson's life and death remained a complex tapestry of deceit, revealing the profound impact and far-reaching consequences of his actions.